Our next speaker is uh, Shin Kong Lau. He is a senior cybersecurity engineer at the CERT division of the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon, uh, where he investigates the intersection between cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Uh, his research interests include rigorous testing of artificial s intelligence systems, building secure and trustworthy machine learning systems, and understanding the linkage between cyber and adversarial machine learning threats. Uh, prior to joining the CERT division, uh, he obtained his PhD in machine learning in 2018 from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Shing Han Lau. So I'm from uh, Software Engineering Institute up at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and today I'll be talking about uh, testing and evaluation of AI cyber defense systems. Um, so, oh, too far. Um, so I've used the words AI and cyber in my title, which means that nobody in this room knows what I'm talking about because nobody actually understands AI and nobody really understands cyber. So when you mix the two together, it's a disaster, right? Um, so the first half of this talk I'm going to dedicate to sort of uh, discussing that intersection of AI and cyber because my observation is that when you get a bunch of people in the room, everybody has their own idea of what AI is and their own idea of what cyber is and people talk past each other a lot. So here's my attempt to facilitate some conversations by laying out what you know, I actually mean by AI and cyber intersection. Um, and the second half of this talk will be uh, discussing some internal research, um, uh, internal research project that I led about developing a methodology for testing and evaluating AI cyber defense systems. So let's talk at the high level first, right? So how is it that we you know, can think about uh, the intersection of AI and cyber? So for me, there's kind of six major areas. So starting in the top left here, right, we can talk about having uh, AI for defending cyber systems, right? So you take all of the traditional things that we're used to for network security, for doing malware detection, endpoint detection, you know, intrusion detection, et cetera, and now we're going to augment and solve all the world's problems by adding AI, right? Um, you can also think about you know, AI for attacking cyber systems, right? So you're talking about having some sort of decision support, right? So think ChatGPT for various you know, tasks, um, or you know, just automating some portion of the red teaming that you're intending to do. You can talk about cyber defense for AI systems, because ultimately all AI is really just software that runs on a computer, right? So you need to defend it in the traditional cyber sense, but the fact that it's AI adds a bit of an attack surface and you need to be aware of that as you're trying to defend. Of course, if you can look at the offensive side as well, right? So um, what is it that an adversary is going to try to compromise? What information is revealed by you know, being able to get the code, get the models, get the data after you own some box that's running an AI? Uh, you've probably heard the term adversarial AI or adversarial machine learning, right? Um, it's been um, popular enough to hit kind of mainstream news. Um, the idea here is just that you're going to attack some AI by having some very cleverly selected valid inputs, right? And I'll talk more about each of these boxes uh, in more detail later. Um, and the last uh, uh, sort of topic here, and one that maybe you've gleaned from the bio that I'm particularly interested in, is um, the actual intersection here of, well, what happens if I have a cyber attack to, you know, create an adversarial AI effect, right? So what happens if I have a traditional cyber vulnerability like a buffer overflow and I'm intending to exploit that in order to make an adversarial AI attack happen? So I'll go into each of those topics in a little bit more detail, but I wanna sort of uh, you know, make sure that as we're thinking about doing test and evaluation of AI systems, you know, what is it that we're actually thinking about? So I would say probably 90 to maybe 95% of the ac academic literature that you'll see out there is in this sort of center circle here, right, the model, because it is the easiest thing to operate with, right? All, as long as you have some data that you can throw past a model to train, and then you can throw more data past it to test, you can pick whatever metrics you're most interested in, you need to take your accuracy, take your F1, take whatever me uh, measures of performance you care about, and you can claim that you have uh, some results, and as long as what numbers you have are higher than the numbers from last month's model, you can declare success, right? Uh, the, problem, uh, the problem is that, of course, uh, nobody actually ever just deploys an AI model. What they actually deploy is an AI system, right? And that system contains a whole bunch of other components on top of the model, and maybe it has multiple models, but it's also gonna have a sensor for collecting data. It's gonna have a whole bunch of pre-processing of that data to do filtering or to you know, shape it into the right format so that you can push it to the machine learning model. And then you're gonna take that data, uh, take that output from the machine learning model and you're gonna render some sort of decision, right? Whether that's presenting some output to a user or taking some sort of autonomous action, right? That's the ultimate goal of the system. 
But of course, nobody just deploys an AI system for fun, right? You deploy an AI system because it's in service of some larger mission. And so the difficulty here is that it's easy to do t and &E of a model, but it sort of provides the least amount of information possible. It's most informative to do t and &E of the entire mission, to ask whether or not your mission is supported by these AI systems that you're deploying, but that also means that your singular data point is a mission, right? And that's extremely expensive, and it means that everything's a one-off. So um, the project that I'll be talking about in sort of the second half of this talk is about our attempt to go from testing a model to testing an entire AI system, which is an area that, as far as I know, is relatively uh, underserved in the academic literature, and I haven't seen too much work of it in kind of closed areas either. So I promised I'd talk about a little bit more about each of those boxes on that first slide. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time here because this is where the project I'm going to describe in the second half actually sits. Um, but the idea of doing AI for defending cyber systems is really just talking about, well, taking, you know, whether it's network traffic or some local execution on a machine or, you know, looking at some particular software samples or suspected malware and saying that, look, that potentially contains enough information that if we apply AI machine learning techniques, maybe we can better detect what is malicious or maybe at least unusual or suspicious versus what's, you know, benign or normal. So um, this slide was funnier when this was clippy, but they told me I couldn't use that. Um, so uh, the idea of using AI for attacking cyber systems is to say, well, maybe I can do some sort of decision support for my red teams, right? Maybe instead of having them manually have to decide exactly what to do based on their expertise, maybe there can be some suggestion of, hey, we've discovered this information about the system so far. Maybe this is the next reasonable step to take, and maybe that is, helps you get to the end goal quicker. You can also think about automation of various tasks that are maybe relatively well defined. Um, you know, just to use ChatGPT as an example, instead of having your red teamer write a bunch of phishing emails, make ChatGPT do them instead, and now you freed up that red teamer to go do something else that maybe is a better use of, of his or her time. There's this idea of continuous automated red teaming, right? Because, of course, we don't want to just assess our systems uh, once a month or once a year, right? We want to really be able to do this on a more continual basis. Um, so obviously having some sort of AI and automation is a, a helpful towards that goal. Um, I'll throw in this fun little tidbit here um, that kind of really captures, you know, how people think about AI and machine learning. So if you have some particular piece of malware, and these are all academic proofs of concept, I should mention. Um, but the idea is that um, I don't want my, someone analyzing the malware to actually know what the trigger is for the malware. Um, so here's what I'll do. I'll just embed the trigger condition in a machine learning model because nobody understands what a machine learning model does anyway, and so now I've completely disguised my intent uh, because nobody can reverse engineer it properly. Um, so I don't know that, I, don't, I haven't heard about this actually being done in the wild, but you know, this is the, the kind of thought process that you can imagine having. So in terms of cyber defense for AI systems, so um, not intending you to read through all the boxes here, but this is kind of a picture of the nominal uh, ML development and uh, test and, and deployment lifecycle. And the real point here is that every box in this big chart is just software running on a computer, right? And because it's software running on a computer, we need to protect it in all the traditional cyber ways. But where it's different is the fact that in machine learning systems, data is sort of a first order concept, right? That in a, a traditional system, if I compromise your data, if I'm able to exfil that data or influence it, that's sort of one level of bad. In a machine learning system, that is akin to arbitrary code execution. I can completely define the behavior of your system by virtue of controlling uh, the, d the data itself. Um, and the bottom line here is that the use of AI and use of machine learning actually expands your attack surface to include the data itself. And speaking, you know, of attacking an AI system, so what is it that an adversary might care to, to obtain? And if you're, you know, uh, on a red team exercise, what is it that might be useful? And the real question is, so what are you trying to steal? Um, how do you even identify that these are the things that you want to steal? And once you've stolen them, what information does it actually provide you, right? So if I manage to figure out what your neural network architecture is, or I'm able to figure out what models you've used as kind of pre-trained or foundational models, or I've figured out you know, what your actual final model is, or your, your training parameters, or your data, or your source code, or your documentation. Um, how do I identify each of those things? And if they're identified and I'm able to, to steal them, what information does that actually reveal? What do I know about how your system's operating by virtue of having that information? Um, 
on the topic of adversarial AI machine learning, I imagine many of you in the room have seen some or perhaps all of these pictures. Um, but one way to think about um, where you can make machine learning and, and AI go wrong is that you can ma either make the system do the wrong thing, learn the wrong thing, or reveal the wrong thing, right? So you've, this uh, upper left picture is sort of a classic in the, the adversarial uh, uh, machine learning literature, right? You have a picture of a panda, you add some carefully chosen but imperceptible white noise, and now your detector thinks this is a gibbon with very high confidence, right? Um, on the upper right, you could think about, well, I'm trying to make my detector not be able to learn the difference between a stop sign and a speed limit sign. Um, and in the bottom here, I'm actually getting the model to tell me what it thinks an automobile or an airplane or a bird actually looks like. So what features it's keying on in order to make those identifications. Now, I showed you a bunch of pretty pictures for two reasons. One, pretty pictures are good for audience attention. Uh, two, most of the work in adversarial AI machine learning happens in the vision domain, right? But now I challenge you to think about what do those pictures look like when we talk about a cyber domain, right? So what does that picture look like if I'm caring about something like network data or I'm trying to do a dynamic or static ex uh, analysis of an executable? Or what happens if I'm looking at a firmware image, right? What is that picture actually, what do I, all those pictures actually look like? Um, in the image domain, the data sources are kind of well known. They're very large uh, corpora of data that you can grab. Um, that's not true in a lot of the cyber domains, right? Like where are you gonna get a whole bunch of firmware images on that you can train? Or where do you have properly labeled, you know, static analysis of executables that you can actually look at? Uh, similarly, uh, on that line, uh, in the image domain, there's at least some good amount of consensus in the community about what types of architectures you should use, what types of features you should use in order to get reasonably good performance. I don't think that's settled for any of the cyber domains. Um, and then in terms of talking about your red teams or adversaries, um, one of the big difficulties that you have that you don't have in the image domain when you, when you look at cyber is that you actually need all of your adversarial examples to still be functional. Right? So if you take an image and you want to do some adversarial thing to it, you can just round to the nearest RGB value and you'll probably be fine. Right? Um, you can't do that in the cyber domain. If you start rounding executables, the thing will just stop executing. Right? Um, and so you need this idea of creating a functional adversarial example. You need to respect the constraints of the cyber domain. That your cyber attacks, if that's what you're looking at, still needs to execute and have its effect. If you have some sort of executable, um, you need it to still be valid and still needs to have the desired properties when you execute it. Um, if you're deploying firmware, you're gonna need it to not break the device that you're operating with because that would probably defeat whatever purpose you're, you're trying to, to obtain after the fact. Um, and so this, this final area here, um, I just point out again that it's often thought that cyber attacks and, and adversarial AI attacks are kind of orthogonal, that there's these totally different things. But in fact, they can be very much linked, right? So you can think about, well, what happens if I insert a backdoor into the machine learning model by uh, compromising the data loader, right? Instead of having to mess with a whole bunch of images to put you know, various adversarial patches or various other things to insert a backdoor, what if I just do that in the data loader, right? Um, what happens if I manage to uh, add some adversarial noise during testing time to get you to classify differently, right? This is sort of a, you know, this might be caused by some sort of traditional cyber vulnerability, but the desired effect is in the adversarial AI space. Um, and I'll definitely point out that um, much of the AI software that's out there is sort of research quality. Um, it is code that works, but it's not necessarily secure code, it's not necessarily well-maintained code, and you can find plenty of exploits in many of the, the popular programs and libraries out there, right? And so all of these kinds of concerns are, are very real. So um, that's kind of the first half. Hopefully that helps to you know, explain where I'm coming uh, uh, from when I talk about the intersection of AI and cyber, all these different ways. Um, now I'm going to transition to talking about the project that I led about defining a methodology for doing T&E of AI cyber defense systems. Um, so you've seen the slide earlier. I'll just point out the, the bold there. So um, what we actually looked at was various uh, products for uh, looking at network traffic and analyzing it to determine what you know, comes from uh, malicious behavior. Um, I will point out that due to the nature of the venue, I can't share the actual results. Um, but there is a distro C uh, final report that I'd be happy to share with folks who you know, are able to see that. Um, but today I'll just be talking about the methodology itself. So uh, maybe to 
set all of this up, why is it that organizations are looking to use a whole bunch of uh, AI cyber defense products, right? And so these are often commercial products, right? If you were at RSA today instead of being here, um, you would probably have many, many vendors telling you about their fancy AI ML, ML solution that will solve literally every single cybersecurity problem that exists in the world, uh, putting all of us out of a job. Um, so why is that? Uh, big reason is because we just don't have enough people, right? There's a shortage in the U.S. alone of about 700,000 uh, cybersecurity positions uh, or cybersecurity staff. Um, and so organizations are looking for any way to make, to stretch their staff a little bit further, and AI can be an effective force multiplier for that, right? So you hope that either you can use uh, AI to solve some of the really easy problems and free up your human analysts to do the harder tasks, or alternatively, you hope that the AI is so good by virtue of ingesting, you know, terabytes of data that it's going to detect all of these kind of low and slow solar winds types of attacks um, that, you know, you wouldn't really reasonably expect a human to be able to detect. Um, there's also the fact that cyber attacks are now increasingly rapid. So the NotPetya attack, I think, is a couple years old at this point. Um, but you know, taking down an entire bank in 45 seconds means that your sysadmin goes to get coffee or use the bathroom, and everything's already down. Right? There's already irreparable damage. And so the only way you can kind of really look to combat that is to have some sort of machine speed solution. And AI seems as good a solution as any other. So. What's hard about testing these types of defenses? So there's a couple of reasons. So first, um, you have to evaluate often in a black box or at least gray box scenario because your vendor, especially if it's a commercial vendor, isn't going to necessarily let you poke around the innards of their software because, of course, that's their secret sauce. So they're gonna, uh, you're just going to be able to test from a black box perspective. Um, there's also the, the point that, by design, these systems must learn over time, right? So they're supposed to adapt to the traffic on your network, and as your network usage changes, it's supposed to adapt to that. And what that means is there's this kind of continual retraining process that's going on. Um, but that means that you need actual data and an actual test bed for, this, for whatever AI you're looking at to actually be able to do that type of learning and do that type of retraining. There's also the fact that because there is this, you know, idea of changing over time, a singular evaluation is not going to be sufficient, right? Just because the AI works at a particular level today does not mean it will do that in a week, in a month, in a year, right? And so that's, there's that need for continual evaluation. Um, and of course, there's, again, the intersection of AI and cyber, right? Your adversary might be clever enough to know that you're using an AI, and they may try to do some sort of adversarial AI manipulation of what they're actually doing to disguise what you know, what their attack, for their cyber attack from your AI defense. So how do we solve these problems? So uh, first, uh, you know, we're basically going to take all of those challenges and sort of address them one at a time. So we'll start by creating a realistic network environment that we can actually have the traffic that's necessary to train and um, to act as kind of the background traffic for the AI during test time. We're going to populate that environment with, uh, with traffic. And then when we actually do the tests, because we are doing a system level test, right, the goal here is not to say that a particular packet was detected or a particular attack step was detected. It's to say that a full attack path that had some negative consequence for the network was actually able to be successfully executed. That is one test case. And then we'll repeat those tests when there's some sort of adversarial manipulation where your adversary is aware you have an AI and is trying to actually uh, bypass detection. And a big part of this is actually the, the tooling development as well, because a lot of this stuff, by virtue of needing to execute multiple uh, tests, and just by virtue of the fact that you don't necessarily want uh, you know, a red team to sit there and hit the same button over and over again, um, there's a need to kind of expedite and at least partially automate some of this testing just to make it feasible. So here's what our network environment looks like. Um, it's not the most modern network, is maybe the first observation. This is an area that we would very much uh, like to improve. Um, but there are you know, various logistical difficulties that we're, we're, we have to overcome. Um, but what we have at the bottom here is sort of the user network, right? your user's terminals. They can connect to you know, a server network here in blue. Um, there's sort of a DMZ, a demilitarized zone here um, that contains a web server and allows you to, con you know, has the internal email server and various other shared resources. Um, all of that within the organization talks out through a central router um, to the world, right? And so we have the ability to emulate um, uh, external email both in and out of the organization. 
Um, the attacker obviously sits outside the, the perimeter of, of the organization, and we actually can just talk out to the internet in general. So when a user goes to browse a web page, you, you see all of the traffic, right? Whether it's the, the traffic from the web page itself, but also all of the ads and all the other background processes that are there. And so these AI devices that we're looking to test generally sit at a central router point, and that's how they're intended to operate. So I mentioned that was the network. Now here's the traffic, right? So uh, of course traffic doesn't just magically appear, and one of the goals for the project is we wanted to avoid actually simulating the traffic directly because that opens you up to all sorts of artifacts that may occur. So instead what we're doing is we're actually going to simulate users, and based on the behaviors of those users, we're going to collect the resulting traffic and use, and that's what the AI is actually gonna see. So we built out this sort of org chart here for organization, about 100 different employees spread across five different divisions, right? You have all the nominal uh, uh, you know, types of tasks that you might see in a software development firm, right? You have actual developers, you have IT folks, you have HR, you have sales, you have accounting, and so on. Um, and for each of these users, each of these basically 100 users that we have, we have a customized work schedule, right? So there's people who prefer to come in early, there's people who prefer to come in late, there's people who are kind of all over the place, you know, they differ in when they take lunch. Um, there are various uh, role-specific work tasks, right? So not everybody in an organization does the same type of thing, right? So we wanna make sure to capture that. And then also, since most uh, uh, networks will have some sort of reasonable personal use policy, we assign all of our users various hobbies so they will go and browse websites and do take activities that are relevant to their own interests. Um, really importantly, we set all of the privileges and accesses for all of our users according to their role within the company. So your sysadmin is an IT person, it's not you know, some intern in sales, because that wouldn't make any sense. Um, and again, I'll emphasize that the traffic that we're, we're using and, and that's generated is because of the, the user behavior, right? The traffic itself is not directly simulated. So how do we do all of this? Uh, we are using a piece of software that was created by a different part of the SCI, um, uh, the Cyber Workforce Division. Um, so uh, the software is called GOSE. It stands for General Hosts. Um, and this was software that was initially designed to support cyber exercises. So they needed some background traffic for cyber exercises, and this was the solution they came up with. We are repurposing it um, in order to be able to continuously generate background traffic. Right, and this is, I should mention, this is publicly available. So if you're interested, you know, feel free to go check that out. Um, uh, and so what, how Ghost works is it basically allows you to create what's called a timeline, which is the behaviors that a user is going to exhibit during the day. And what we've done is to build a timeline generator that allows us to have really fine grain control about what each user is going to do on each day, right? So perhaps, you know, on some days the user is going to be on PTO, so they're just not going to generate any traffic because they're out of the office, right? Um, perhaps you have some sort of team meeting, and that means you have some sort of correlation in terms of the traffic that you're actually going to generate because everybody's sitting in the same room at, in some meeting, and so on. And there's a high degree of customizability here. Um, in terms of the sort of actual tests, right, so um, this slide is mostly uh, to illustrate kind of a nominal full cyber attack path ranging from kind of step zero here, which is kind of your pre-attack reconnaissance types of activities, right, through initial access, through various types of priv uh, privilege escalation and lateral movement and so on, and then you achieve on the right there some actual goal that has a negative consequence for the owner of the network, in this case, uh, data exfiltration, right. And so this is one test unit for uh, what we're looking at. Um, and the way that we're actually doing these tests is we're using um, some software out of MITRE. It's uh, publicly available again. Uh, it's called Caldera. And basically, if you imagine each of those stages that we had on the last diagram, they're all encoded here for specific activities in terms of what this means on the network. So here's the specific command that gets executed on a specific machine on the network um, as part of the, you know, this assessment. Um, to kind of gauge how much of the full space of attacks that we're covering, uh, we're mapping this to MITRE attack. Um, so uh, it's worth noting that not all of the attacks that are within the, the MITRE attack framework are reasonable for uh, testing an AI, right? So if you have something like uh, phishing a third, you know, getting credentials from a third party website, um, that's never gonna be seen by the AI that's under test here, so it makes no sense to actually test something like that. Um, so far, we're covering about 70 uh, of the techniques in the methodology, so it's part 
seven of these techniques are captured in this, uh, these attack steps that we, uh, uh, you know, uh, that are part of the attack paths that we're uh, using. And in terms of the attack paths, these are kind of the four that we have right now, and we're looking, you know, of course, to expand this out. Um, but these are things that I could, I think, plausibly claim would have a negative impact on your network if they were to happen, right? So if an adversary were able to uh, create a domain administrator account, that would be bad. Um, if they were able to create a local administrator account, um, in this case on a privileged user or somebody from the IT uh, help desk group, um, that would be bad. If they disabled your public-facing web server, you know, uh, or if they were able to exfiltrate all the user's files, right? These are uh, demonstrably bad outcomes for the owner of the network. And that's kind of the point. Um, and so these tests that we're performing are in both a baseline condition, so that is we don't take any particular precaution. Your adversary is unaware maybe that you're using an AI or just doesn't care. Um, and then also an obfuscated condition where they're trying to at least cover their tracks to some extent. Um, and the for the purposes of the work, we ended up doing an initial test and then a test after one month. But you could equally imagine that you'd repeat this test, you know, every couple of weeks or every couple of months uh, at whatever intervals to capture um, whether there's a change in how the AI is actually performing. So um, again, I'm sorry I can't share the results in this forum, but uh, feel free to reach out, and I'll be happy to share them with you uh, as appropriate. Um, but in terms of where we're headed in the future, well, like, where are we looking to make various improvements? So one major area is in the, the actual test bed. Um, so uh, instrumenting a lot of different points in our network to get a lot more data with some degree of ground truth is one thing that we're definitely looking at. Um, having a bunch of PCAPs for, you know, all over the network would be particularly useful for understanding, you know, the adversarial machine learning side of things and what it would mean to manipulate some of these packets. And what that corresponds to in terms of the attacks or the change in the attack that you would have to actually do. Um, we would really like to sort of more uh, modernize our, our test network so we're not really having a bunch of you know, microservices that are you know, connecting to the cloud or doing uh, various other types of things that are common in, in modern networks. Um, a lot of that is a logistical issue and you know, um, getting, uh, being confident that we're not going to uh, raise the ire of various lawyers. Um, uh, but that's something that we're trying to improve. Um, improving the automation itself, so this idea of being able to automate sort of at an above the VM level, right, to really be able to uh, ideally be able to say this was the activity of the red team, this was what the blue team would have seen based on the uh, device that's under test, and be able to automatically bring that information together uh, without needing to do a whole bunch of manual legwork, which is uh, both time consuming and of course uh, more error prone than some automated system. Uh, of course, we have simulated traffic, or well, we have simulated, uh, we have collected traffic from simulated user behavior, which is nice, but it's no substitute for actual real data. Um, accommodating replay traffic would be nice. Um, there are some technical difficulties with that. You know, which parts of the network do you actually need to have full fidelity on? Which parts can you actually replay? Because of course, you need to inject your attacks into the network itself. Um, and then, of course, always broadening the set of test attacks, right? The broader your sort of test coverage here, the better idea of how, uh, the better idea you'll have of how well your system under test is actually performing, right? What is it that you can actually expect your AI defense to actually protect you against? Um, how robust is that protection going to be? And how long is that protection going to last as it undergoes this continual retraining process? Um, so with that, um, there's my contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out, especially if you want to see the report, um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Any questions? Hello. Um, in your setup of your simulated network environment and then in your simulated users, um, were you able to use any kind of um, sensitivity analysis or design of experiments to understand how much that affected the results of what was detectable or not or what was effective or not from a, from a cyber and AI perspective? Um, so just curious about the, the sort of test rigor there. Yeah, so um, we haven't had the opportunity to do that type of analysis. So it was, uh, it took all the resources we had to just get a network up and running and a set of users. Uh, but certainly part of the idea here is that because we have the ability to stand up any 
uh, network that we want, and we have Ghost to be able to simulate any type of user behavior or even automated behavior that we want, um, we would be able to do those types of analyses to say, well, is it a particular type of traffic or a particular type of network that a device works well on and it doesn't do so well on a different type? Um, we haven't gotten there yet, but that's certainly uh, a question that we would like to be able to answer. So I have a question. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So is there any intent to put this on a live network, you know, like with an actual set of users? You know, one of the stupidly hard things to do, right, is to make a network that looks like an actual network. I mean, exercises are still kind of con contrived and whatnot. So um, I guess the, que the question is, do you have plans to, like, actually deploy this, you know, against an AI system during some kind of assessment? Um, I would love to. Um, but the problem is that uh, it's very difficult to convince somebody with an actual network that you should be able to do various types of tests on it unless you've demonstrated some capability already. So hence the starting with this kind of more simulated environment um, where ideally we show that we can get useful results and because of that they'll say, okay, well, let's look at this on a real network or at least give us some replay traffic that we can work with first before we jump to the actual network. We should chat. Any other questions? <clears throat> Well, let's thank uh, our speaker again.